Hey everyone, uh, my name is David Robertson. I'm going to talk about some joint work with Laura Minchinska that combines entanglement theory from quantum information, quantum monomorphism groups from non-commutative mathematics, and homomorphism counting from discrete mathematics. We'll be talking about quantum isomorphisms, which are a relaxation of graph isomorphism based on quantum strategies for non-local games. And non-local games are the things that make up multi-prover interactive proof systems. The particular result I want to talk about is our recent proof that two graphs are quantum isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from any planar graph. The talk has two parts. In the beginning, uh, it's going to be more about results, and I'll talk about graph isomorphism and some relaxations through a few different uh, lenses. And in the second part of the talk, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the ingredients of the proof. So here are two graphs, and you might be able to tell by looking that they're really the same graph, they've just been drawn differently. And this is what we mean essentially when we say that two graphs are isomorphic. More formally, an isomorphism is a function from the vertices of one graph to, the, to another that's a bijection, and it preserves adjacency and non-adjacency. So here I'm using this tilde to denote that two vertices are adjacent. So whenever an isomorphism exists, we say that G and H are isomorphic, and we uh, denote it with this congruent symbol. We can also uh, give this nice algebraic or matrix formulation for graph isomorphism in terms of the adjacency matrix of a graph. So the adjacency matrix of a graph is a symmetric 0, 1 matrix, such that the UV entry of the matrix is 1 if U and V are adjacent in your graph and 0 otherwise. And this matrix formulation says that um, two graphs are isomorphic if and only if you can find a permutation matrix P that satisfies this equation. Essentially what this says is I can reorder the rows and columns of a sub g in the same way so that I get the adjacency matrix of the graph H. Um, sometimes we'll write this equation as a sub g times p equals p times a sub h, um, but of course it's equivalent since p is unitary, we can bring, bring it over to the other side. Okay, so now that we know what graph isomorphism is, let's see if we can describe it in terms of a game. Uh, this is going to be a, a particular non-local game, and the idea is that uh, two players, Alice and Bob, want to convince a referee that they know an isomorphism uh, between G and H. And the way they play the game is that the referee starts off by sending each of Alice and Bob a vertex of one of the graphs. It can be a vertex from either graph, but for simplicity, let's just assume they both get vertices from G. Well, then Alice and Bob, they have to respond to the referee individually, each with a vertex of the other graph, in this case, H. In order to win, they have to satisfy a certain condition. Namely, they have to uh, satisfy that the vertices that they, uh, from G are related in the same way as the vertices from H. And here by related and by this rel notation, what I mean is whether the vertices are equal, adjacent, or distinct, non-adjacent. And an important part of the game is that the players aren't allowed to talk to each other during the game. So they can get together beforehand and agree on a strategy, and they know the graphs G and H beforehand. But once they get their questions from the referee, they can no longer communicate. Uh, if they could, then they could always win the game trivially. You can think that they just play one round of the game, uh, but we want them to win with certainty, so with probability one. And another way of thinking about this is that they need to win no matter what questions they get from the referee, and they don't know ahead of time what question they're going to get. So it might not be too surprising to you that uh, you can win this game classically, with a per perfectly, if and only if the graphs are actually isomorphic. So you can imagine that, well, if I have an isomorphism from G to H, I can just respond according to this isomorphism. I get a vertex from G, I respond with this image in H uh, under the isomorphism, and this will allow me to always win. And showing the other direction is not that much more difficult. Okay, so we've seen that this game uh, sort of characterizes graph isomorphism in terms of its classical strategies. So now we want to use that to sort of motivate this definition of quantum isomorphism by considering quantum strategies for the same game. So we don't change the game, but we now allow Alice and Bob access to some sort of quantum resources. What this means is that they're going to share some entangled quantum state, and 
whenever Alice gets her question from the referee, she can perform some local quantum measurement on her part of the state uh, and she gets some outcome. And we can just assume that uh, the outcomes you get are sort of indexed by her possible answers to the referee, in this case, the vertices from one of the graph. Bob uh, has his own set of measurements that he does the same thing with. Um, and this is how they, they play the game. Now, what's important to remember here is that even though we've given them access to this sort of strange entangled state, this doesn't allow them to communicate. So it doesn't allow them to sort of cheat the game in the sense you might be thinking. What it allows them to sometimes do is sort of correlate their behavior in a way that might not be possible classically. So what does this mean mathematically? Well, this quantum state that they share, this is just a unit vector in some Hilbert space. And our measurement is just a collection of positive operators that sum up to the identity. Now we also require that all of Alice's operate, operators commute with all of Bob's operators, although Alice's operators don't have to commute with each other and similarly for Bob. And so these are kind of the mathematical ingredients for a quantum strategy. And once you've decided on, uh, on these parts of your strategy, then when you play the game, you're not gonna necessarily play in a deterministic way, but in a probabilistic way. And the way you determine this probability is using this formula. So what this says is that the probability that Alice and Bob answer with H and H prime, assuming they receive G and G prime from the referee, is equal to this inner product, where we take these two measurement operators, multiply them, apply that to the quantum state psi, and then take the inner product of psi. And assuming the above conditions are met, this will always be a, a probability distribution for a fixed G and G prime. This probability distribution is often called a correlation. And we say that two graphs are quantum isomorphic whenever there's some perfect strategy for perfect quantum strategy for this isomorphism game. Uh, and by perfect, of course, I mean that you win with probability one, but this is the same thing as saying that you lose with probability zero. And losing with probability zero means that this probability here is zero on wrong answers. So you can tell whether they win or lose uh, by just looking at this correlation P. Okay, so you, if it's your first time seeing that, you might think, okay, that's kind of a lot of uh, ingredients to kind of have to juggle uh, to put together a quantum strategy. But luckily we can simplify it at least a little bit and we can get a nice matrix formulation that's really analogous to the classical case. But here we're gonna use a quantum permutation matrix. So what's this? Well, instead of the entries uh, being just some numbers, they're gonna be elements of some C star algebra. And we want that each entry is a projection. So it squares to itself and it's equal to its own star. The other condition we want is that we, if we sum along a row or a column, then we get the identity element in the algebra. What you might notice is that if, you, if your C star algebra that you're using is just the complex numbers, then this is actually just a permutation matrix because this condition of Pij squared being equal to Pij, this says that all the entries are zero, one. And this uh, other condition says that there's exactly one, one in every row and column. So this is exactly a permutation matrix. And the theorem, which might not be surprising uh, that we proved with Martino Lupini in a previous work, is that gra graphs G and H are quantum isomorphic if and only if you can find a quantum permutation matrix that satisfies this equation here. And this is exactly analogous to the classical case, we just added the word quantum everywhere. So just a few remarks. Um, a quantum permutation matrix is always unitary, and this means that uh, if you have two graphs that are quantum isomorphic, then they have to be cospectral. And by that, I mean that their adjacency matrices have the same multi-set of eigenvalues. Okay, that's uh, all nice and good, but what if quantum isomorphism already implies that two graphs are isomorphic? Um, I mean, it's not clear from the definition that that's not the case. And in fact, that was really the most challenging part of the original work where we defined quantum isomorphism is finding examples that were quantum isomorphic but not isomorphic. But eventually we were able to uh, construct such examples uh, using a reduction from a different type of non-local game based on binary linear systems. And this type of game, it's, there are known examples that have perfect quantum strategies but no perfect classical strategy. So here's uh, one graph of a pair of quantum isomorphic but not isomorphic graphs. Uh, it has 24 vertices, and the other graph in the pair is on the next side here. Um, so 
maybe it's not so obvious that they're not isomorphic, but in fact they aren't, but they are quantum isomorphic. Uh, and this is the smallest known example. Okay, let's return to the game for a moment. And now we're gonna talk about a wider class of, of strategies than just quantum strategies. Uh, so recall that in the quantum case, we, our strategy was sort of built out of these operators in this shared state, uh, but in the end, we got this correlation out that was produced by this strategy. Another thing you might wanna consider is, okay, what if we had just assumed that the players play according to some correlation, but we put some restrictions on that cor correlation. And a non-signaling strategy is where we just require that this correlation that they're using doesn't allow them to communicate with each other. Um, now, mathematically, this is just some linear constraints in the correlation. And it basically says that Alice's marginal distribution that she sees doesn't give her any information about Bob's input from the referee. Physically, you can sort of think that, well, as long as I believe in the universal speed limit of the speed of light, uh, then I could put Alice and Bob far enough apart and require them to answer quick enough that there's no way they could send each other information uh, in the time allowed. Um, and so even if there is some sort of super quantum uh, physics uh, that we might discover in the future, as long as you believe in this universal speed limit, you can be assured that their strategy must be non-signaling. Of course, quantum strategies are non-signaling because we already remarked that they do not allow you to communicate. And what we showed with that Sirius and others is that you can win the isomorphism game with a non-signaling strategy if and only if there's a doubly stochastic matrix D that satisfies the equation A sub G times D is equal to D times A sub H. Now, this actually turns out to be known as fractional isomorphism, which is a previously studied um, uh, relation on graphs. Okay, so we've seen the definition of quantum isomorphism in terms of these quantum strategies for non-local games, but what if we want to understand it uh, from a more combinatorial point of view? What does it mean for two graphs to be quantum isomorphic uh, purely in terms of, say, some kind of uh, combinatorial description of some property they must share? Uh, and that's the question we're going to look at in the next few slides, and the way we answer it is by counting homomorphisms. So a homomorphism is slightly more general than an isomorphism. You Oh, don't need a bijection. You don't even need an injection. You just need to preserve adjacencies. So you just map edges to edges. So here we map a seven cycle to a five cycle by folding up this path of link three into a single edge. And we're going to use hom of f comma g to denote the number of homomorphisms from f to g. So there's this really beautiful theorem from Lobos from about 50 years ago that says the two graphs are isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from any graph F. Uh, so one direction is sort of easy. If they're isomorphic, they must have the same number of homomorphisms, of course. But the other direction does require a bit of work. There's also a sort of folklore result in algebraic graph theory that says that two graphs are cospectral if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from any uh, cycle. Uh, this is usually phrased in terms of closed walks, uh, but a closed walk is just a homomorphism from a cycle. More recently, uh, Dvorak in 2010 and then independently Delgo and Rattan in 2018 showed that two graphs are fractionally isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from any tree. Uh, and both sets of authors actually also uh, characterize what happens when you count homomorphisms uh, from graphs of, of some bounded tree width. It's a really beautiful result. And now our result is that you can get a similar characterization uh, for quantum isomorphism. Uh, in particular, two graphs are quantum isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms for any planar graph. I think this is a pretty nice and surprising result because when you hear this definition of quantum isomorphism, it certainly doesn't make you think about homomorphisms or counting problems or, or even planar graphs. And so I think this is a really beautiful connection between these different areas. It also answers a question raised by Delgar and Rattan, uh, which is whether or not having the same number of homomorphisms from any planar graph already means that you're isomorphic. And so now we know that it doesn't because there are quantum isomorphic graphs that aren't isomorphic. It also answers another question they raised, which is about the complexity of uh, determining if two graphs have the same number of homomorphisms from any planar graph. Um, so we know from our previous result that determining if two graphs are quantum isomorphic is undecidable, uh, 
And so this means that if you give me two graphs G and H, determining if there's some planar graph that has a different number of homomorphisms to them is an undecidable problem. Um, and in fact, it's complete uh, for the class RE. Now, this may be, you think it's not surprising because, well, there's an infinite number of planar graphs you have to check. But of course, uh, if you wanted to check all graphs, then this is equivalent to isomorphism. And so you can do that in the worst quasi-polynomial time. And these other relations from the previous slide, cospectrality or fractional isomorphism, those you can decide in polynomial time. So this is actually a bit of an outlier here, and I think it's pretty remarkable. So here's sort of a quick summary of what we've seen so far. Uh, on the left-hand side are these four relations, isomorphism, quantum isomorphism, fractional isomorphism, and cospectrality. And then along the top are these three different ways of viewing them, rather in this matrix formulation or strategies for a non-local game or counting homomorphisms from some class of graphs. Um, and there's one empty block. Okay, so now I want to tell you just a little bit about the proof. Um, and it really starts with this previous result where we made a connection between quantum isomorphism and quantum automorphism groups in the graph. Uh, now, these might sound like they're basically the same thing, but actually they're defined completely independently. Uh, we saw the definition of quantum isomorphism in terms of these non-local games, but the quantum automorphism group of a graph, this is sort of a very abstract object defined in terms of universal C-star algebras. It didn't really have a, a link to anything physical before the connection to quantum isomorphism was made. Now, I don't want to go sort of too into the weeds with uh, all of this quantum group theory stuff. I want to really stick to some more combinatorial aspects of the proof, which is really the main part of the proof, where we give a combinatorial description of what's known as the intertwiners of the quantum automorphism group. So what are these intertwiners? Well, classically, the intertwiners of the classical automorphism group of a graph, you can think of these as kind of a matrix encoding of orbits on tuples of vertices. Um, for the quantum case, this breaks down a little bit because you can't really define these tuple, uh, orbits on tuples for, for large tuples. But all you really need to know is that these intertwiners for the quantum automorphism group are generated by just three matrices, U, M, and A sub G. And these four operations, uh, matri uh, matrix product, tensor product, uh, conjugate transpose, and linear combinations. This matrix U is just the R1's column vector. And this matrix M, if we apply it to uh, EI tensor EJ, where these are standard basis vectors, then if I is equal to J, we just get one copy of EI out, and otherwise we get zero. So the idea is that we want to come up with a combinatorial way of describing these three matrices, and then a combinatorial way of describing these three operations. And that's going to give us a combinatorial description of the intertwiners. And we do this uh, with what's known as bivalent graphs. These were, um, these were described in Lowrass's book, Large Networks and Graph Limits, but actually the idea goes back to at least the 1980s in some unpublished notes of Neumeier. So an LK bilabel graph, this is just a triple where the first thing is a graph, and then A is an L tuple of vertices from F, and B is a K tuple of vertices. So here's an example. Here our graph is just a complete graph on four vertices K4, and the first tuple, which I call the left tuple, is 2, 1. And the second tuple, which I call the right tuple, is 2, 2. Uh, now, what we want is a way to sort of draw these bilabel graphs. So just like with graphs, it's just a list of vertices and edges formally, but that's not really how you think about them. You think about them in terms of these drawings with these points and lines. Um, for a bilabel graph, well, for the graph part, we know how to draw a graph, but we need to add something to incorporate the information about these tuples. And the way we do that is by adding what we call wires. So in this case, the left tuple is 2, 1. And so we indicate that by having two wires that start on the very left-hand side of the diagram. And the first wire, starting from the top, needs to go to the vertex that's in the first entry of the left tuple, in this case, 2. And the second wire should go to the uh, vertex, which is the second entry, in this case, 1. And we draw the wires a bit thinner than the edges to help distinguish them. Similarly, on the right, the tuple is 2, 2, so both wires should go to the vertex 2. So this is how we draw these bilabel graphs. And now here are three sort of suggestively named bilabel graphs, U arrow, M arrow, and A arrow. And what you can see is that actually this U arrow and M arrow, the graph part doesn't have any edges. In fact, it just has a single vertex, and then the U arrow has a wire going to the left, and the M arrow also has two wires going to the right. 
A arrow, the graph is K2, the complete graph on two vertices. And then there's one wire uh, for each vertex, one going to the left and one going to the right. Okay, well, um, how do I use these to describe the intertwiners? I need to get some matrices out of them because the intertwiners themselves are matrices. And we do this uh, by counting homomorphisms and defining what's called a homomorphism matrix. So we'll do an example of just a one one bilevel graph to keep things a bit simpler. So here we're gonna fix some graph G and uh, look at a bilevel graph F, F arrow. And then the homomorphism matrix, uh, is gonna be a matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by the vertices of G. And then the UV entry of this matrix is the number of homomorphisms from F to G that map A to U and B to V. In other words, this matrix accounts all of the homomorphisms from F to G, but it partitions them according to the images of A and B. So let's do a specific example. Here's this A arrow, a bilabel graph. And now if we look at this homomorphism matrix for some arbitrary graph G, and we look at the UV entry, this is counting the number of homomorphisms from K2 uh, to your graph G that maps one to U and two to V. Well, one and two are adjacent in our graph, uh, K2, so U and V should be adjacent if there's any homomorphisms uh, that meet this condition. And in the case that there is, there's exactly one homomorphism because we've already specified the images of one and two. And otherwise, there's zero homomorphisms. In other words, the homomorphism matrix of A arrow is just the adjacency matrix of our graph. You can similarly show that the homomorphism matrices of U arrow and M arrow are the matrices U and M. And so now we have a combinatorial way of describing these three matrices, A sub G, U and M, that generate the intertwiners. And now we need a way of describing these operations of matrix product, tensor product, and conjugate transposition. So we're gonna look at a uh, product uh, first. So what we want is that we define some product on bilevel graphs such that if I look at the product of the homomorphism matrices of two bilevel graphs, it's just the homomorphism matrix of the product of these bilevel graphs. And the way we do, do this is if we look at the product of F1 and F2, we, take, we draw F1 here on the left, and we draw F2 on the right, and just like with matrices, we need the dimensions to match up. So we need that F1 has the same number of right wires uh, as F2 has left wires. And then we just join these uh, wires uh, in between F1 and F2, and then we contract them uh, and merge the vertices on the ends. And then we retain the left wires from F1 and the right wires from F2 to get a new bilayer graph. So here's a more concrete example. So you can see here that you can sometimes get loops uh, in the product. So this is because we merge this vertex three with both vertex C and with vertex A, and A and C already have an edge between them. So we gain a loop there. Um, if you get multiple edges, uh, you can just ignore that and replace it with a single edge. For uh, the other operations, for tensor product, it's even easier. We just draw uh, the first bilevel graph uh, above the second bilevel graph sort of vertically. And then for the uh, conjugate transposition or star, we just uh, flip about the vertical axis. In other words, we just swap the left and right tuples. Okay, so now we know how to de describe combinatorially these matrices U, M, A, A sub G, and also these operations, matrix product, tensor product, and conjugate transposition. So now what we need to know is, okay, what are the bilevel graphs that are generated by these three bilevel graphs and these three operations? And it turns out that it's some class of planar bilevel graphs. And the idea is just that you're able to draw the bilevel graph in a planar way. More formally, for bilevel graph F, we create this auxiliary graph F circle, where for each wire, we create a new vertex, which we connect together in a, in a cycle that we call the enveloping cycle. And uh, for each vertex corresponding to our wire, we make it adjacent to the vertex that wire went to in the graph. And then our class is gonna be the bilevel graphs such that this F circle has a planar embedding with the enveloping cycle bounds the outer face or really any face, but usually we pick the outer face. And then of course it turns out that these, these are exactly the bilevel graphs generated by U arrow, M arrow, and A arrow and these operations. This gives us our combinatorial description of the intertwiners and the connection to the qu quantum isomorphism I mentioned before uh, gives us our combinatorial description of quantum isomorphism in terms of counting 
homomorphisms from planar graphs. All right. That's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for listening.